dear president, dear ministers, dear Mary, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we have just under a thousand days to go before our deadline to meet the MDGs expires. Despite uh, impressive progress so far, much remains to be done. So it's time for us to scale up our efforts and fulfill our promises. Every night, more than 870 million people go to bed hungry. Undernutrition, the worst form of poverty, kills more than 2 million children every year. And 165 million children in the world today are suffering from standing and its lifelong consequences. We know that the world has the means and the technical solutions to remedy. So I am very grateful to Yimon Gilma and Mary Robinson for inviting me to join you for this conference. It is a welcome initiative reflecting Ireland's commitment to place the critical global challenges of hunger, nutrition, and climate justice at the very top of the development agenda. It's true that in the last 12 years, 600 million people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. The Millennium Development Goals deserve definitely some of the credit for this, the greatest ever achievement in poverty reduction. The Millennium Development Goals have been instrumental in setting priorities and rallying unprecedented support for poverty eradication. But now we need to design an ambitious post-2015 framework that uses the Millennium Development Goals as a springboard towards making extreme poverty a thing of the past. The UN High-Level Panel on the Post-2015 Development Agenda, in a way, is trying to lead the global debate on the future post-MDG framework. As initial contribution to that debate, the European Commission has recently put forward its policy proposal called A Decent Life for All, Ending Poverty and Giving the World a Sustainable Future. With poverty eradication at its core, it is a global aspiration, aspiration but understands that national targets and commitments need to be involved. Our post-2015 framework must build on the MDG successes, but also address their shortcomings. This is a true for nutrition, as for any other development challenge. Last month, I visited Burundi in Malawi and have seen immense progress by increasing food production and reducing hunger. However, if you regard nutrition, the picture is different more than 50% of children under the age of five are stunted. And the current MDGs framework, it seems, has failed to capture this hidden tragedy sufficiently. So it's clear that we must redress this situation and ensure a real focus on hunger and nutrition in the future framework. We still don't know how this framework will be put together. It will be rather tough work how it will be structured in terms of goals and then target. However, for me it is clear that food and nutrition security are clearly one of those to be taken forward and addressed comprehensively and seriously in post-2015 Millennium Development Goals agenda. There is currently a debate on the way to handle these issues in the next framework. Some voices following the Rio Plus 20 discussions call for making food security and nutrition a goal in itself. Others propose to mainstream these issues as targets in different standalone goals, such as end extreme poverty. But the good news is that food security and nutrition security, nutrition security feature highly in the political debate, and I am sure in one form or another it will be in the next development agenda. As the world's largest grant donor and number one donor in the area of food security, 
the European Union has already paved the way in that respect by adopting a new policy framework on nutrition with specific targets on stunting reduction. But it's also very clear that success will not be sustained if we will not manage in the fight against climate change. And we have made our development aid in last years more climate compatible, and we support specific climate-related actions. I would just give two examples. The first is the Global Climate Change Alliance, which offers a platform for dialogue and a source of technical and financial support to over 35 countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. By the end of 2013, we have already used 285 million euro to implement over 45 programs, supporting adaptation in climate sensitive sectors such as agriculture, coastal zone protection, and land and water management. A second example that is now being created is Sustainable Energy for All initiative, which in addition to tackling climate change through energy efficiency, will promote also rural electricity supply and particularly focusing on smallholder farmers that we have spoken so much today. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot of consensus with what I have said with my previous speakers. There is no divergence. It's really that we should take all means available to us and really to deliver. And I would agree with my previous speaker. It would be shame if we would not manage it. Thank you very much for your attention.